Hello church, my name is Bruce Greeno and I'm one of the pastors of this great church, Community Presbyterian in Ventura. You know, a few of us were talking just this week about how if this crisis had happened even a few years ago, we would not have been able to have worship even this way. We're not sure what we would have done. And while it seems incredibly strange to us, maybe to be sitting and, and, and experiencing worship this way, certainly for those of us who are individually making our little videos somewhere, like our backyards, and then sending them in so Aaron can edit it them to they, together and then we can produce a whole worship service, we realize that we're still the church. We're the church because we're not a place, we're a people, we're the body of Christ. And we can worship even in these times in this distant manner because we have the Word of God. It's what calls us to worship, it's what teaches us, and we have the Spirit of God which fills us. So we hear these words as we come today to worship, these words from Psalm 95, as we worship together as the body of Christ. Oh come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise, for the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the heights of the mountains are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Come, let us worship.
Good morning, church. We're so happy to be worshiping with you this morning. Will you join me in praying for and blessing the children? Lord and Heavenly Father, we lift up the children and youth of our preschool, church, community, and world to you. We pray that they would know you and know your deep love for them. We pray that they would, when they are troubled, look to you for their refuge and strength, that they would have a faith so strong that they would be at peace and not afraid when they are uncertain. We pray for those children and youth that are missing their friends and family in this time of quarantine. Please give them avenues of connection and relationship with those friends and family that they are missing. Lord, we pray your blessing upon each and every child and youth, and we thank you so much for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, church. I'm on. I'm very grateful for Pastor Bruce last week doing the sermon from here, and we're starting to slowly move things back into this great room. We miss the room. We are so looking forward to our regathering, and it's our intention and plan over the next couple weeks to fold in more and more elements of our worship service in this room and uh, prepare for the reunion, and so we're looking forward to that. Uh, today we're going to look at Psalm 46. This is a beautiful psalm, classic psalm. It's the one which we'll see in, in just a moment that Martin Luther based his great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, is based on this hymn. And it is a, a great word. So we're going to look at that this morning. But before we do, before I read it, uh, let's pray together. Will you join me? Lord God, would you hear our prayers? Would you use this time, wherever we might be, watching this at whatever time of the day or week we might be viewing it, would you bless each and every one of us, every person, for those who maybe don't know you or, or who have drifted from you, would you pull them back with your tender word and your encouragement? For those who are in love with you and desiring growth and to go deeper, would you feed them through your word this week? For those who are facing anxiety and worries and fears, Lord, the psalm speaks so well to it. It is so beautiful. And so would you take these words and speak to our fears and our worries and give us peace. Lord, use your holy word to bring holiness and joy and peace and life and light into the lives of all who hear it. And we praise you, Lord Jesus, that you are faithful and true. We give this time to you and we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, as we've looked at the Psalms, our incredible statements, declarations, laments that come from the heart of who we are as people. And we've seen, uh, and we'll see more as we journey through this through more of the summer, that there are times of just uh, absolute highs. I thank you, God, you have met me in my deepest need. You have been there. And then there's also laments of where were you when I called out for you? I'm seeking you and you've not come. My, my, I'm wasting away. Uh, and all of the anxieties, all of the feelings, all of the hopes and the dreams, the fears, they're all embedded in the Psalms, the 150 Psalms. And it's because of this real world perspective that it speaks into our lives so beautifully. People love the Psalms and for, for every right reason. And so we listen to Psalm 46. I invite you to listen to this passage. Uh, Psalm 46, God is our fortress, is the heading of this. Listen to the word of God. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, and she shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. The Lord utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. 
Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and he shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted across the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word. Well, let's look into this and and bounce around a little bit in, in its themes. There is in the Hebrew, it doesn't come out in the English, but there is in the Hebrew a particular tense of the verb and the way that it looks at things. And it's not so much describing something that has happened, but describing things that are always happening. It's not describing an event that occurred somewhere in history, but things that are always rolling on through life and through time. The first of these things that are a permanent reality that are just unfolding is chaos. The Hebrew world saw chaos as a very real thing, and, and it, for those of you who love surfing or, or anything having to do with the ocean, that was a very foreign concept to the people of Israel. And the ocean was terrifying to them. The waves and the storms that came up from them were terrifying and a sign of chaos, a sign of the, the sea trying to take over the land and take over all that was safe and habitable. And so even in the description that the sea is pecking away at the mountains, the most stable things there are, and that the sea is pecking away at it, eroding it, and causing even the mountains to fall in. For the Hebrew mindset, chaos, it was a terror, and the seas personified it. And there are in this passage three different perspectives of chaos, three different realities that are manifestations of chaos. The first is the natural order, the seas pounding against the shore and and bringing it down. The second in verses four through seven are surrounding armies. The psalmist is picturing an army around his city and says that God encamps around them and he will rise up at the dawn. But it's an image and this whole psalm is really an image of warfare and that the city is surrounded. And finally, the third area of chaos is simply nations in turmoil, nations at war, struggles between nation and nation, which causes the whole world, the region, to experience constant upset. And the tense of the, vo- the, the verbs, what it's indicating in this is these aren't one things that just happened here and there, over and done with, but these are realities that are just ongoing. And we live in this day, you don't have to look very hard at newspapers or online news or wherever you might get your news and to see that the same is true today. We live in a profoundly chaotic world. There are times of peace, to be sure. There are times when it slows down. But as a world, and the more we know about the whole world, we hear the same things. There's chaos in the natural order. The first uh, hurricane has been, or at least potential hurricane, has been named for the season, and it's been predicted that it'll be a rough season. Whether it will or not, nobody knows for sure. But the natural order swirls around the possibility of hurricanes and storms, a huge storm, one of the biggest that's ever hit Bangladesh, hit yesterday. There's chaos in the natural order. We read very little of, uh, it takes very little reading to see that there's chaos in the war, or of wars around continual battles and struggles and strife, and we see those, and we see the tumult of nations, and so all of this is very real. At the same time, using the same tense of the verb, which is really the same through pretty much the whole psalm, the psalmist describes another reality that's not describing something that just happened, but a reality that's ongoing, just as ongoing as chaos, and it fills more of the psalm. It is the more important part. The chaos is underneath all of this and has to be understood as as the the foundation kind of from where he's looking. But the real story is the other part of an unfolding, never-ending, regular part of our lives, and that is the presence of an active, caring God. The psalm begins, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in time of trouble, verse 1. It sees God, the psalmist writes and sees God as present, not distant, not hidden, not uncaring, but present, and present in such a way that he is not only able to help, but willing to help. God is portrayed through the whole of this psalm as intimately connected to his people, profoundly involved in the lives of his people, 
And this is an ongoing reality, God's presence and help. And we see it in different ways, in more detail. It speaks about how God is in the midst of the city. God is present with his people, dwelling in the holy city, Jerusalem. And therefore, it's not going to be taken. It was common for battles to begin in the morning. And so the, the word of this says, God will help when the morning dawns. That at the time of need, when the enemies come and try and press against the walls and go over the walls or through the gates, God will be there. He's not only present, he is present to help. And he is present, as it says in verse 7, the Lord of hosts not only is here, but the Lord of hosts with his armies. The host means his army. And this Lord of hosts is with us, with his might, his armies, and he will defend us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So the psalmist in this chaotic world, and we don't want to forget that. We're not, we don't want to be Pollyannish and say, oh, just believe in God. Everything's going to be fine. It's okay. Just trust. Everything will be okay. That's not what the psalmist is saying. He's saying that there are very real chaotic events and, and things in our world. The natural order, the, the, the threats to a city and to its people, the kingdoms that are surrounding. These bring chaos, but at the same time, and even more powerfully and passionately, with greater emphasis, the psalmist is saying, but God is the stable thing in all of this. Not even the mountains can compare with the stability of God, the trustworthiness of God. He is present. He can be depended upon. You can't run from him or hide from him. You cannot stop his will, his good will and his good plans, and he will care for his people. And so through all this whole thing, we see a present God at work, and he's doing great things. We see how he's subtly changing water, which is chaos in the shores, that the image in verse 4 where it says, there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God. This word river is not the normal river of streams. It really means irrigation canal, something that's been dug, and it's a picture of God calming the waters, calming the chaos and providing drink and what is needed for the city, that the chaos of waves and ocean are nothing to him, and in the midst of his people, he takes careful uh, irrigation canals to bring the water that the city needs. He is absolutely in control, and he is taking care of us, and it's our work, our role, our, our task as believers to trust him, to trust God in this tumultuous world, that he's going to take care of us, he's in the midst of it, said and done. Now, you might think that that's where we could just stop because it states out the problem really clear, chaos, and it states out the, the answer profoundly clear. There is chaos and turmoil, but God's in the midst. It's going to be okay, full stop, end of story. What else needs to be said? But we should be honest. Whenever you bring, come to the scriptures, when we approach the scriptures to read and seek God's will and understanding, when we come pull out his word and to seek to apply it to our lives, we want to always be honest. And if we're really honest, I think, we don't always feel like the reality that the psalmist is describing, God very present, God very active, God in the midst of the city taking care and fighting our battles. If we're really honest, it just doesn't feel like that all the time. And in fact, I would venture to guess, in, in all my years of pastoring, I think it's fair to say that I've never known anyone who's been in faith for very long who hasn't felt this is not really real in their life at some point in their life. That there are seasons and times in our lives where it feels like God is distant and absent. It doesn't, doesn't feel like he's our refuge and our strength, that God is dwelling right in the midst of our lives and world. In fact, it feels very different that we're, we're alone. Sometimes it feels like the bills and the expenses that are coming in are far more profound and real and loud than God's promise to take care of us. As real as that promise is, he talks about the, the birds of the air that he feeds and the lilies he takes care of, and will he not take care of us? And we can say amen, amen. But there are seasons where it feels like the bills and the expenses the needs that are coming at us are just a lot louder and a lot more real. There are seasons where it feels like unanswered prayer is more the reality than answered prayer. The, the, the desire to see change and to ask God for help gives way to sometimes years of praying for something, a burden, a fear, a worry, 
that goes unanswered for years, and it feels that God is, is more distant and uninvolved than what the psalm describes. It seems, if we're really honest, I think, in all of our lives, there are times, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter, but multiple times in all of our lives where it seems like the addiction wins, the cancer is stronger, the voice of anxiety or depression is louder, the loneliness is captivating, the sorrows are overwhelming, and we could go on and on and on. The reality is in these lives, it's that kind of chaos that as much as the promise of God's presence is there, and as much as it's real, and as much as we should believe it, the simple fact is is that sometimes the noise of chaos is louder. And in some ways, it's not surprising for a lot of reasons, but let's look at one. We live in a world where there are countless voices being raised calling us to fear, endless voices telling us how bad the world is, how dangerous the world is, how it's fallen from, from good to bad and bad to worse and worse to horrible, that the progress of history is downward, that things are only getting more and more evil. The voice of calling people raising in people a sense of fear is profound and it's all around us. We watch the news, read the news, read the stories from all kinds of different outlets or whatever it might be and you hear a fear of different nations and what they're doing to our economy or how they would influence us or hurt us, whether it's terrorism or economic things, the fear of the nations is proclaimed and loudly often captivates. We are told that we should be afraid of others, others who want to come and seek what you have or take what you possess, others who want to take your way of life for themselves and leave you behind. We, we have fears thrown at us that if somehow we don't make the government be what it's supposed to be or get the right judges on the bench, the United States is doomed, that it's going down the tubes into horrors unimagined, and you have every reason to be afraid. There are countless voices that bubble up at us saying, everything in this world is getting worse, dangers are rising. There are people out with nefarious, evil schemes trying to take over this world, take over everything that we know. You should be afraid, you should be worried. And we buy that, we listen to that voice. Maybe not as intentionally as we'd like to think. Maybe we even approach these voices rationally, thinking that we're listening to them and evaluating them, but the reality is they captivate us. They speak into the depths and they change us. A number of years ago, there was a dear man in the church who was dying slowly on hospice and I would go visit him every Monday walked from the church here up and spent an hour, hour and a half with him every Monday. And I noticed in these visits that there was a very different mood in the afternoons when I'd get up there, depending on what had happened during the the morning, through the morning and the early afternoon. He loved sailing. And if he was watching the America's Cup races and the sailboat races, when I got there, he was excited and buoyant and talkative and told me stories of his childhood, of growing up sailing and racing sailboats and how much he loved that world. But the more times, more often, I would come to the house and find that he was very morose, very depressed, angry, uh, bitter, and, and hurt and worried. And these feelings were captivating and they filled every conversation that we had. And I found in time that those feelings of morose, depression, anger, they were directly proportional to the amount of news he watched that morning on his favorite station. That it created fear in him, it created anxiety in him. And I would talk to him in these days that were leading towards his death and say, is it really worth your time to look at this? And should you not be looking at the scriptures and looking at the love of God and how he's pulling you into his presence? But more often than not, the fears of this world through his favorite channel captivated him and took him over. And fear became the consuming part of so many of his days, even his last days. Fear is a voice that is very easy to promote. It's so easy to point to all the wrongs and all the enemies and all the people that are out to get us instead of 
taking up the perspective of the psalm. And what's interesting in all of these things is that we have exact, in all of these messages, we have the exact opposite message of the psalm. We have, instead of the psalm's message, that the greatest reality that we know is God's protective care and love, the fear mongers tell us that it's chaos that's our greatest reality, and it's going to overwhelm us. It pronounces and proclaims that God is not present among us, and, and he's not helping us but rather chaos is threatening to undo us. And that if we need help, if we're going to find refuge, it depends upon us to create refuge. We find this very curious thing that instead of, as the psalm describes, a God who defends us, we hear people declaring that we need to defend him. In the American religion, the church, all that we have known and held dear in our faith and beliefs are going to be taken away from us and we have to defend God, which is very weird very ironic, and completely against the tone of the psalm and the tone of the scriptures. He doesn't need our defending. He doesn't need our defense. He needs our faith and our trust. It's what he asks for, is our faith and our trust. So all of these combine to create a world that's completely opposite from what the psalmist says. You trust God. He's in the midst. Rather, we don't sense God, and if we're going to have refuge, we've got to make it ourselves. But here's the rub. God wants us entirely to depend upon him. And he has no problem pulling the rug right out from under us if we start trusting in other things, our own abilities, our own resources, what we need to achieve and pull off. He has no problem upsetting the apple cart, putting us in turmoil and chaos to bring about change. And one of the classic places to see this is in the New Testament, in the life of Jesus. Where it, and it's in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but in Mark is one of the most pressing and telling versions of the same story. And it's Jesus in the boat with his disciples and the storm comes. It says a great storm, a windstorm came upon them. And in the Greek it says it beat against the side of the boat so that it was filling the boat up. And the disciples are absolutely terrified. So what we have here is a classic picture in in the Hebrew sense with the storm and the waves, a classic picture of chaos coming to overwhelm people. We have a classic picture of terrified disciples. They probably did everything they could at first, bailing the boat and doing everything they could to pull down sails and steer towards land. But as things got worse and the boat filled more and more, they become, become absolutely terrified and certain that they're going to die. Because what they do is they come to Jesus and they wake him up. And where in some of the other gospels, Matthew, for example, they say, Lord, save us. In Mark, their words are teacher, not Lord, but teacher. Have you no concern for us that we're about to perish? And the word is very strong. It's it's the word that's used of, of, of the demons being thrown into hell, of absolute utter destruction at the end of time. And and they're saying, Have you no concern? Do you not even care? that we're about to go under. So we have a perfect uh, illustration, picture of terrified disciples. We have a perfect description of what the person living the life Psalm 46 calls us to in the person of Jesus. He's asleep in the back of the boat. It's hard to picture with waves bouncing the boat around, the wind howling, but apparently he was so utterly exhausted that he pulled a cushion, a pillow of some sort, and laid upon it, and he was out deep, so deep that the waves didn't even wake him up. It wasn't until his disciples came and raised him, and this is what it says. They came and woke him up, and he shakes himself asleep, but he is in perfect peace. In the to- storm and the chaos, he has, he has no fears. And it's a perfect picture of God, exactly like Psalm 46 describes, that he is in the midst of us, and Jesus stands up, And it literally says he woke himself up. You picture him being so asleep that he had to shake the sleep off and stand up and look for a minute at the wind and the waves. And he literally says in Greek, he literally says, shut up to the wind and the waves. He shut up, be still. And in an instant, there was silence and a deep, uh, uh, in Greek, a mega calm, a mega calm. And the disciples were, were filled with a fear and said, who is this? They can command even the winds and the waves. But then Jesus gives them two classic questions. Why are you afraid? And why do you not yet believe? And these are the most important questions as we come into Psalm 46 and come out of Psalm 46 to ask this, these two related questions. Why are you afraid? 
sure, there's a lot of reasons. There's a pandemic circling around. There's all kinds of economic horror stories of how bad it might be, and they may be absolutely right. Who knows? We'll see how it unfolds. There's stories of international intrigue and conflict and horrors. All of this is real, and yet it's upon us to decide, are those more real? Is the chaos more true, or is God in the midst of us more true? Are you more in the hands of a chaotic world that's seeking to undo you? Is that how you view your life? Or are you more in the hands of a faithful God who is truly covering you, in, in whose refuge you are hiding? What we want to learn how to do in this, in the psalm, is, is choose faith over fear. It's an, it's an intellectual exercise. It means taking time to spend time in Scripture and absorb those words more than the news, even as true as the news may be as accurate as it may be, as important as it is to know, to let the truth of who God is and the truth of God's promises be what define who we are, faith over fear. And take the eternal over the temporal. Martin Luther said in this hymn that was built upon this, though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. God is working out an eternal purpose, and the chaos can't stand against him. And there may be turmoil, and there may be hardship. There are addictions, and cancer, and depression, and anxiety. These things are real, but we don't face them alone. And God is not asking us to solve them on our own, but to trust that he is with us, that he will walk with us, that he will cover us and protect us. We choose the eternal over the temporal, the godly realities over the worldly realities. We choose wisdom over folly the wisdom of going in the world in a way that makes sense, of recognizing that there is a disease, a virus, and how you catch it. And it makes sense to wear masks, and it makes sense to have social distancing. It's wisdom. And while we could go without masks or break the, the guidelines that have been given, while it's probably within our legal right to do so, it's not wise. Wisdom would say, how do we live in a way that promotes health? And that leads into the next thing of love. A, a, a life of love and care, to say, I am willing to sacrifice my rights for the good of another, to wear a mask so another doesn't get sick, to even do the shutdown that we've had to do at the church so that our seniors especially, but everybody in reality, would have a better chance at health and life, to lay down our rights for the good of the greater whole. That's biblical. That's putting good above evil. That's putting the eternal over the temporal. That's putting others over ourselves. All of these things are biblical. And we could defend our right to do this or do that, but if you'll notice, if you read the scriptures, you will never once see Jesus defending his personal rights. His life is a story of continually laying them down for the good of others and trusting his Father to steer him through the chaos, to protect him and do through him and in him and with him all that is desired. And what God had for his life is a model for what is to be our way of life, to walk with God in faith, to have faith triumph over fear, the eternal over the temporal, wisdom over folly, others over self, love over hatred, and to live the lives of the psalm that there is a God. He is our very present help. There is chaos around but that's not the defining thing in our lives. The presence of God, his love, his grace, his promises to help, that's what defines who we are. And so I would ask as we close those two questions that Jesus asked his disciples, why are you afraid? And why have you not yet believed? It's time to believe that there is a God who will take care of us and to go deep in our trust, deeper than we ever have. That's the message of Psalm 46. God bless. Have a great day, great week. Bye. Oh, come behold the works of God, the nations at his feet. He breaks the bow and bends the spear and tells the wars to cease. Almighty oh, one of Israel, you are on our side. We walk by faith in God who burns the chariots with fire. 
Lord of hosts, you're with us, with us in the fire, with us as a shelter, with us in the storm. You will lead us through the fiercest battle. Oh, where else would we go but with the Lord of When we come together for worship, it's absolutely appropriate, even necessary, that our worship should include both a time of offering and a time of prayer. The opportunity to recognize that God's Word calls us to offer our lives in response to it. And we can do that in so many different ways. The ways of checking in with friends and family, writing a card, Checking in with any one of our local or global mission partners and seeing if there's anything you can do to help. But also in the giving of your own tithes and your offerings, you can mail checks to the church. Our financial secretary, uh, Shannon, is the one person who works uh, nearly every day in our office. Uh, she's picking up the mail. You can also use our push pay uh, online giving. You can check that out on our website. But we want to take this time as offering and as prayer as well and invite you to pray with me. I'm going to give you opportunities to either think or say out loud names. Well, let's lift those up to the Lord as we uh, go through this prayer time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for being our refuge and strength, our very present help in these days that feel broken and distracted, distant, even lonely. We pray for those who feel the pain and grief of broken lives. 
lost lives, lonely lives. Lord, hear the names of those we lift to you now. We also give you thanks for all of those who serve in our military. And especially this weekend, we think of those who have given up their lives sacrificially while in active service. Those who have died in warfare and conflict. Some names that we lift to you now may go back as far as World War II. Father, hear the names we lift to you. And we give you honor and praise for your power and mercy, your works and your shalom, and pray it will happen all over this world. We pray for those we know from next door to across the globe, that they will know your grace and goodness, hear your voice, and know the salvation offered us in Christ Jesus. Lord, hear the names of those we lift to you now. And Father, help us to hear your voice, your call to bear your image and likeness in this world. Let us have your eyes to see the world as you see it, your ears to hear the cries and your hands to meet the needs. Let our hearts break for that which breaks your own. Lord, give us your own spirit and move us to carry out your will. Lord, hear our voices now as we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, good morning once again, church. As we come to the end of the service, I want to give you, uh, I was going to say a couple of announcements, but really one. And uh, it's, it's kind of a work in progress, but we have been pondering more than once and over a number of weeks the issue of communion and how do we do communion in this exile. And what we've chosen, at at least initially, is to just postpone it, to wait, to yearn for it, to look forward to the day we come back into this room and we can have communion together. But as we've been out a number of months and we're not exactly sure when we're coming back, we're hoping that maybe mid-June is a target date we're aiming for, but it may or may not work. Depends on how the dates unfold from the governor's office and the CDC, but in any case, we're wrestling and raised again, session raised again, the possibility of doing communion. And so I want to raise, as we introduce this, some very important things. We don't, in the Presbyterian Church, do home communions. I mean, in the sense of private communions. And there's a reason for this. And it goes back, for good or ill, back 500 years to the Protestant Reformation. And back in the 1300s, 1400s, early 1500s, before the Reformation, you could pay a priest to come to your home and celebrate the Mass with you, to bring a personal blessing of the sacrament to you, an individual or a home, and you you would pay for that, but it was a personal thing, as well as done in the church. And when Martin Luther came along, and Calvin, and Bucer, and Zwingli, and the others, they said, absolutely not. The sacrament is not meant to be a private, individualistic thing. It is not about just your own little touch with God, but about being in the community with brothers and sisters who are are faithful and walking this journey with you. And so you never have communion at home. We never have taught that in the Presbyterian Church. And, And yet, how do we have communion? How long do we go without it? A number of churches are doing it online in different ways, inviting people to get juice and bread or wine and bread and join us as we celebrate communion here and join us with that. And we're toying with how to do that and putting that together as a possibility. But we wanted to remind you that it is a very special thing that if we do it that way, and what we want to emphasize is the community in all of this. 
If you may or may not have noticed, but every time we celebrate communion on the table, there are the regular elements that we all take and, and usually at least one little gray box. And that box, along with eight or 10 or 15 others, will be taken that day out into the world to our shut-ins. People who are in nursing homes or in their, in their own homes and aren't able to come to church anymore and we bring communion to them. But the significance of it and the symbolism of it is that the communion elements that they are taking come from here and us. And while they're taking it in their home, they're, they're taking it with us. That the very bread and juice have been on the table with the ones that we took. And not only that, it's forbidden that when one person would go to another house uh, alone. It would be two people always because it's a community event. So when we do communion, it's always a community event. So we're working. We wanted to let you know we're wrestling with this idea, and it's very possible that in the next couple of weeks we're going to have an online communion service. But we just want to make sure that you understand the significance of this. You might want to start talking to kids or grandkids about it and explaining that what we're going to do is do this together over the wires, so to speak, and try to make it a corporate event, even though it's celebrated in our homes and that the important thing is in the communion, to unite ourselves to Jesus and to be united under him as one family of faith. So we'll tell you more about it. It's going to come out on the Wednesday things. We'll keep you informed of if and when we're going to do it. Right now, the tentative date is June 7th, but we're going to explore that a little bit more. And uh, we'll see where it goes, but I wanted to keep you informed. And if you got questions, call. We'd love to talk with you about communion and, and these sorts of things. It's anything. Give us a call. The phone lines work at the church. They come to, come to us, and you're not alone. And now as we close the service, let me just say how proud I am again of you all. You're the best church ever. Your love and care for one another has been astonishing, and the stories that are coming into the staff are delightful. And we're really grateful for your effort, your faith, your love. So may you continue in the faith that you have so well lived out. May our great God bless you and cover you. May he walk beside you. May he be a strong refuge, a strong tower in the midst of your life, and may you feel him as a refuge. May he push fear from your life and fill your world with joy and peace and faith. May he overwhelm you with his goodness, and may you be blessed of this great God this day, this week, and every day of your lives, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless your church. Thanks for being with us.